Welcome to Redeemer Lutheran Church. My name is Pastor Griebel, and this video is part 35 of a Bible study based on the book of Genesis, as it says there on the screen. Our focus today will be on chapter 30. Before we get to that, though, we have our opening hymn, O Holy Spirit, Grant Us Grace. Grant us grace that we, our Lord and Savior, in faith and fervent love embrace and truly serve him ever. The hour of death cannot bring loss when we are sheltered by the cross that canceled our transgressions. Help us that we thy saving word in faithful hearts may treasure. Let air that bread of life afford new grace in richest measure. Oh, make us die to every sin. Each day create new life within that fruits of faith may flourish. And when our earthly race is run, death's bitter hour impending. Then may thy word in us begun continue till life's ending until we gladly may commend our souls into our Savior's hand the crown of life obtaining. And we join in our opening prayer. O oh God, you once taught the hearts of your faithful people by sending them the light of your Holy Spirit. Grant us in our day by the same Spirit to have a right understanding in all things and evermore to rejoice in his holy consolation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, let's get right to our study, as I said, of Genesis chapter 30. Just a little background introduction before we get into it. Again, we are talking about Jacob, one of the Old Testament patriarchs. He is living in Paddan Aram, where his grandfather Abraham originally had come from. And now he has been married to both of Laban's daughters, Leah and Rachel. And he is starting to have a family, starting to have children. In the previous chapter with his first wife, Leah, the older sister, he has already had four sons, and now he fills out the rest of his family. When Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she envied her sister. She said to Jacob, give me children or I shall die. Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel, and he said, am I in the place of God? who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? Then she said, Here is my servant Bilhah. Go into her, so that she may give birth on my behalf, that even I may have children through her. So she gave him her, her servant Bilhah as a wife, and Jacob went in to her, and Bilhah conceived and bore Jacob a son. Then Rachel said, God has judged me and has also heard my voice and given me a son. Therefore she called his name Dan. Rachel's servant Bilhah conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. 
Then Rachel said, with mighty wrestlings I have wrestled with my sister and have prevailed. So she called his name Naphtali. When Leah saw that she had ceased bearing children, she took her servant Zilpah and gave her to Jacob as a wife. Then Leah's serpent, servant Zilpah bore Jacob a son. And Leah said, good fortune has come, so she called his name Gad. Leah's serpent <laughs> Leah's servant, Zilpah, bore Jacob a second son. And Leah said, Happy am I, for women have called me happy. And so she called his name Asher. In the days of wheat harvest, Reuben went and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother, Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, Please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she said to her, is it a small matter that you have taken away my husband? Would you take away my son's mandrakes also? Rachel said, then he may lie with you tonight in exchange for your son's mandrakes. When Jacob came from the field in the evening, Leah went out to meet him and said, you must come in to me, for I have hired you with my son's mandrakes. So he lay with her that night. And God listened to Leah, and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. Leah said, God has given me my wages because I gave my servant to my husband. So she called his name Issachar. And Leah conceived, and she bore Jacob a sixth son. Then Leah said, God has endowed me with a good endowment. Now my husband will honor me because I have borne him six sons. So she called his name Zebulun. Afterward, she bore a daughter and called her name Dinah. Then God remembered Rachel, and God listened to her and opened her womb. She conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph, saying, May the Lord add to me another son. Okay, so that's the story of how we got the 12 tribes of Israel the 12 sons of Jacob. There's one more yet to be born. That'll come a little bit later. But this is the story of how they were born. So how important was having children to Rachel? She thought that if she did not have any children, she would die. That's, you know, not the attitude that a lot of women have today. They can either take it or leave it when it comes to childbearing. But in those days, and still in many cultures, if you do not have children, especially if you don't have a son, then it really is in some ways worse than death. What was Jacob's response to Rachel's distress? So Rachel goes to Jacob, complaining that she has no children. He's like, am I in the place of God? And I really like that response because I believe that all children are a gift from God, no matter how they're conceived or whatever. And so that's what Jacob says. Um, God is the one, basically, who gives us children. And since you're not having any, don't come to me. It's not something I can do. It's only something God can do. Am I in the place of God? How is Jacob and Rachel's solution to Rachel's childlessness similar to Abraham and Sarah's solution? Back in Genesis 16, we read that Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go in to my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And he went in to Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. So in both cases, we have a woman who has no children. So she takes her servant girl and gives her to her husband, who then produces a child that is claimed as the wife's child. As we call this surrogacy, in order to provide a child for a childless woman or a childless couple. What are the laws regarding surrogacy in Minnesota? Well, we have none. So everyone can do as they please. I know there have been some laws proposed about surrogacy here in Minnesota, but as far as I know, no laws have been passed. And so 
if a couple wants to use a surrogate, they pretty much have to sit down with their own lawyers and work everything out. There's no laws that dictate and uh, govern how this is done. The Lutheran Study Bible has the following words to say, in many cases, modern technology allows people to turn God's gift of childbearing into a product they can obtain or refuse at will. Such manipulative attitudes are as old as Leah and Rachel. And so in this case, Rachel was so desperate to have children and really saw it as a competition between her and her sister that she was willing to give her servant to her husband to produce a child that she would then claim as her own. How did Rachel view childbearing? She viewed it as a competition with her sister Leah. So when Rachel's servant finally had a child that she then claimed as her own, uh, that was Rachel's comment. I have competed with my sister and now I have this child and so now I can no longer have the shame of childlessness. I have uh, competed with my sister and I have won. What did Leah do so that she could have more children? She gave her servant Zilpah then to Jacob. And so these two sisters, very competitive apparently, and we talked about this in the previous chapter where Jacob marries both sisters and we talked about polygamy and how the Bible never outright condemns it, but and it's definitely mentioned and several prominent people in the Bible were polygamists and had more than one wife. And uh, the Bible never condemns it, but then it always talks about all the problems that are associated with polygamy and it's never shown in a positive light. So here in this case then, Leah gives her servant Zilpah to Jacob so that she can have children because they're being very competitive. With what did Leah then hire Jacob to lie with her? She hired Jacob with the mandrakes that her son Reuben had found. Another thing we talked about in the previous chapter was how Jacob loved Rachel much more than he loved Leah. And so because Rachel was the loved one, um, she really kind of ruled the family. And so in this case, Reuben had found some mandrakes when he was out in the field. Rachel wanted the mandrakes. And so Leah said, fine, you can have the mandrakes, but here's the deal. I then get to sleep with my husband, namely Jacob. What's a mandrake? Well, a mandrake is a root that is used to make perfume, and it was thought to have fertility powers. So who called the shots in the family? Rachel did. As we said, she was the one that Jacob loved more than Leah, and so because of that, she really had the upper hand in the entire family in dictating uh, who got to sleep with whom and so on and so forth. Who was Jacob's only daughter? Then Leah also bore Jacob a daughter, Dinah. We shall hear more about her in a later chapter. In what sense did God remember Rachel? So it says he remembered Rachel and she finally gave birth to a son, named him Joseph. Uh, in Genesis 8, in connection with the story of the flood, God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. God made a wind blow over the earth and the waters subsided. From Psalm 25, remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been of, from of old. Remember not the things of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. So it's not in the sense that God ever forgets about anybody. He knows everybody and he never forgets anything. But remember in the sense of remember your mercy. Remember what you have promised to do for us, O Lord. And so he remembered Noah in the ark and made the waters subside so that Noah could come out from the ark. He remembered Rachel so that she could have children and remove the, ch the shame of childlessness. And as in particular here in Psalm 25, Remember God's mercy and steadfast love from of old. And that's the most beautiful way that God remembers us in his mercy and in his love. With what did God finally bless Rachel? He blessed her with a son of her own, namely Joseph. Okay, let's go ahead and read the rest of the chapter. 
As soon as Rachel had born Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, Send me away that I may go to my own home and country. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you that I may go, for you know the service that I have given you. But Laban said to him, I have found, If I have found favor in your sight, I have learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. Name your wages and I will give it. Jacob said to him, You yourself know how I have served you and how your livestock has fared with me. For you had little before I came, and it has increased abundantly. And the Lord has blessed you wherever I turned. But now when shall I provide for my own household also? He said, What shall I give you? Jacob said, You shall not give me anything. If you will do this for me, I will again pasture your flock and keep it. Let me pass through all your flock today, removing from it every speckled and spotted sheep and every black lamb, and the spotted and speckled among the goats, and they shall be my wages. So my honesty will answer for me later when you come to look into my wages with you. Every one that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and black among the lambs, if found with me, shall be counted stolen. Laban said, Good, let it be as you have said. But that day Laban removed the male goats that were striped and spotted, and all the female goats that were speckled and spotted, every one that had white on it, and every lamb that was black, and put them in the charge of his sons. And he set a distance of three days' journey between himself and Jacob, and Jacob pastured the rest of Laban's flock. Then Jacob took fresh sticks of poplar and almond and plane trees and peeled white streaks in them, exposing the white of the sticks. And he set the sticks that he had peeled in front of the flocks in the troughs, that is, the watering places where the flocks came to drink. And since they bred when they came to drink, the flocks bred in front of the sticks, and so the flocks brought forth striped, speckled, and spotted. And Jacob separated the lambs and set the faces of the flocks toward the striped and all the black in the flock of Laban. He put his own droves apart and did not put them with Laban's flock. Whenever the stronger of the flock were breeding, Jacob would lay the sticks in the troughs before the eyes of the flock that they might breed among the sticks, but for the feebler of the flock he would not lay them there, so the feebler would be Laban's and the stronger Jacob's. Thus the man increased greatly and had large flocks, female servants and male servants, and camels and donkeys. All right, let's take a look at some of these verses. Why did Jacob need Laban's permission to leave? Probably just out of courtesy and respect. Jacob had come there freely and Laban had welcomed him and they had worked together for 14 years now and um, so Jacob wanted to leave and establish his own family separate from Laban and just simply out of courtesy and respect asks for permission to leave. Why was Laban reluctant to have Jacob and his family leave? Because God had blessed Laban abundantly while Jacob was there. When Jacob arrived, Laban had, didn't have much. But since Jacob arrived, he had grown in greatly in wealth. By what means had Laban learned that the Lord had blessed him through Jacob? Through divination, it says. He had found this out through divination that God had blessed Jacob. It's a very interesting situation here that Laban finds out something from God, basically, through divination. Because later in Deuteronomy chapter 18, this is what Moses has to say about the sin of divination. When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering, anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens or a sorcerer or a charmer or a medium or a necromancer or one who inquires of the dead. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord and because of these abominations, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. So this Laban character apparently 
had no problem using divination to find things out. And so he found out through divination that God had blessed him through Jacob. But Moses calls uh, divination one of several satanic abominations, that they were not to follow these things at all. What deal did Jacob and Laban make for Jab Jacob's wages? Jacob would receive all the black, speckled, and spotted sheep. What is ironic about, about the words of Jacob in this verse, Jacob, who had been deceitful with his brother Esau, now boasts about his honesty. I will take only the speckled and spotted sheep, and so it will be very clear that I have dealt honestly because Laban's sheep will not have any streaks or stripes or spots, no black sheep, and mine will be all the spotted ones, so it will be very obvious that I have been honest. It's kind of ironic because in the past, Jacob had no problem with being dishonest. How did Laban again trick Jacob? He then took all the sheep that he had agreed to give Jacob, the black, the speckled, and the spotted ones, and hid them from Jacob. So this Laban character, he also is very deceptive, very sneaky guy. And so the two are just kind of a good match. They're kind of, they just, you know, really deceive each other, whatever chance they have, and uh, dishonesty, you know, they claim to be honest, but they really aren't with each other. And then how did Jacob get the upper hand after Laban's deception? Well, he developed a system of sticks that, he, that caused the sheep only to bear the kind of sheep that, according to his agreement with Laban, belonged to him. And this, to me, is one of the strangest verses in the Bible, passages in the Bible, where he peels the bark off these certain uh, pieces of wood, puts them in the watering troughs in front of the sheep when they are drinking, and then when they are drinking, they come and they mate, and so their offspring then, because they are looking at these striped uh, sticks while they're drinking and mating, then their offspring becomes striped and spotted and so on and so forth. So it's just a really strange thing. It's a thing that, you know, as we find out, <clears throat> looking ahead, how had Jacob come up with his system of increasing his flocks? If we look ahead to the next chapter, in the breeding season of the flock, I lifted up my eyes and saw in a dream that the goats that mated with the flock were striped, spotted, and mottled. Then the angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob, and I said, here I am, and he said, Lift up your eyes and see, all the goats that mate with the flocks are striped, spotted, and mottled, for I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. So God showed Jacob in a dream how to increase his flocks and then um, decrease Laban's flocks. So because Laban had tricked Jacob, then God helped Jacob by revealing to him this method of increasing his flocks and decreasing Laban's flocks. Very fascinating story. When did the flocks breed? As I said, when they came to drink at the watering places, so this is very efficient. They're drinking and getting their drink of water, but they're also mating at the same time. They are uh, multitasking, if you will, and that's when they would breed, so that's when Jacob set up this system of these with these sticks. What were Laban and his sons doing while Jacob was increasing his wealth? I have no idea. It seems strange to me that Jacob could do all of this without Laban's knowledge. But apparently he was able to do it right under Laban's nose. And so his flocks kept growing and Laban's did not. And yet they could clearly see that Jacob was not stealing because the two different kinds of sheep and goats were being kept separate. The striped and spotted ones were going to Jacob. But the uh, pure ones were staying with Laban, so there was no way that Jacob could be accused of being dishonest. But how he could do all this without Laban's knowledge is really interesting. All right, that concludes our look at Genesis chapter 30. We hope you've enjoyed this study. And if so, like it on YouTube and share it with other people. If you have not already become a subscriber to Redeemer's YouTube channel, we in invite you to do so. That way, whenever we publish a new video, 
you may be notified. We would greatly appreciate that if you did. We conclude, we conclude then with the benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.